we can go ahead and get started. Um, I'm um, and uh, with the Cabinet for Economic Development, and this is the last in our uh, series that we've been running with Eva Garland Consulting. Eva's with us today uh, to do our last webinar of this series, and I will hand it over to her. Great, thank you, Christine. And I'm very happy to be presenting this last seminar. Um, this is uh, probably the most exciting of the seminars because it's what happens once you actually are being considered for an award, all the way through obtaining your award, managing your grant, um, and looking at next steps, follow on funding. Um, I have here with me today, Tara Mullis, who is our senior compliance expert at Eva Garland Consulting. And so she is going to be talking through a lot of the uh, details of what you need to be aware of from the time that you're notified from the agency that you are being considered for a potential award that you've packed, passed the scientific merit review and are now getting into the administrative aspects of whether your company is eligible for an award. So um, I will uh, uh, turn this over to her. Um, our agenda is up here today. Uh, got the grant, now what? What reporting requirements can you expect? And then finally, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how you can ensure you're competitive for the phase two and other follow on funding. So uh, here is Tara. Hi, good morning. Um, as Eva mentioned, we're going to go over the post award process and kind of look into the details of what's required. Um, we'll go a little bit more into specifics on various agencies, NIH, NSF, and some DOD. Um, as things Typically, the, the federal compliance will remain overarching the same, but there are nuances within each agency that will need to be addressed um, at time of award. So initially, when you're looking at the award process, we need to ensure that we are responsive. Time is of the essence. Um, a lot of times, the information, when it is in the award, ready to be awarded, awarded phase, the government then all of a sudden needs everything now. And so it's important to review the information provided, typically in an email, um, by one of the, the program directors or a grants management specialist, and ensure that you're reading the deadlines, as those will be very specific and the timing is very important. Um, the main area of concern is going to be making sure that the accounting system in place is in place. That is going to include not only the software, but the internal controls and personnel that will be helping ensure that the overarching processes are there for grant compliance. So moving forward. For the NIH award process, the typical process is going to include what we consider the just-in-time phase. The just-in-time phase is going to be an email from the grants management specialist that is going to detail specific support documentation that is required for review prior to issuing the final notice of award. This will include a SBIR, STTR funding agreement, ensuring that you are a small business, that your overarching corporate structure has not changed since the time of proposal, and that the information as initially proposed is still true to date. The financial evaluation is going to be the document that is going to detail and confirm that the company is in fact um, supporting the federal regulations through their accounting system. So this is going to request a balance sheet and income statement to outline that there are segregation of costs. You are going to sign off that there is time sheet and timekeeping policies in place and that their overarching segregation of duties to ensure that the company is um, diligent in managing the funding received. The other support document is going to be for key personnel, both within the organization as well as the sub-award. This is going to ensure that the, at the time of award, that the individuals listed as key personnel do not exceed 100% effort on federal awards. So if an individual um, is working on this award as well as other awards or pending awards, we would need to indicate that in the other support. For anybody that has exceeded the 100%, we need to evaluate their level of effort either on the proposed grant or other um, awards that they are currently working on. 
The animal and or human subjects approval information will be detailed in the just-in-time process and will typically include the, the assurances required for these types of um, studies. They're a little bit more specific and the information a lot of times is going to be managed between the, the company and the subaward. So there are opportunities for inter-institutional forms as well as you know, training certificates, but this will be only if applicable. Um, the notice of award for the NIH will include the specific terms and conditions. A lot of times I find that companies kind of overlook some of the details that are included in the notice of award. It has a lot of information and it is going to be the roadmap for how to move forward with certain deliverables. Um, the funding for NIH is received through the payment management system. The process is going to be a cost reimbursable process, meaning that the funding has, got, has to be spent prior to being reimbursed. The funding, when, I'm, when we're talking about a cost reimbursement process, is going to be directly related to the direct funding. So with the direct funding, you can request a proportional amount of indirect and fee, depending on what do you have proposed in the initial submission. All right. So looking specifically at the notice of award, the important areas to note are the grant number, which will be right up at the top. You'll have your principal investigator, the, the project title, and then very important, the budget period. The budget period is going to be what that funding that's outlined below is going to be represented that time period. If the award is a multiple year effort, then the funding will be incrementally coming in. So we need to note that the budget period. Um, the other thing to note about the budget period is with NIH, they typically allow a 90 day look back period. So we wanna look back 90 days from the budget period to understand if we can capture any direct costs that were incurred during the pre-award process. So this is where we'll, we'll focus on that information. Um, going down to the second page of the Notice of Award, it will outline the different direct categories. So we'll have, typically you'll see your salaries and wages. If you had a proposed fringe, it would be separated out here as well. Consultants, sub-award, all of the different direct categories as outlined in your proposal. All of those will be totaled up to account for your direct cost. Your indirect funding um, for NIH, you can request a maximum of 40%, which is considered the safe rate. This will appear as the FNA cost, the facilities and administrative cost. So those words indirect and FNA are interchangeable. On top of the indirect and direct funding, you are allowed to request up to 7% fee. So as you can see, the fee is broken out separately as well. Um, the fee portion will allow for you to use the funding to support any activities, whether um, direct, indirect, or unallowable. If you look down in the middle section there, you'll see the, that this is a multiple year award and that year two is being funded. So the separation of showing the, the incremental funding is demonstrated here, but please note that the, the amount of funding being awarded and broken out above is only reflected in the year two. A separate notice of award will be issued for the phase three. Continuing down, we are going to look at the, page three is gonna go into the terms and conditions. Um, this section is gonna outline, you know, the expectations and the limitations of the award. Typically in this section, you will see the reporting requirements um, for, NIH awards, the typical closeout process will be indicated in this section to include the final federal financial report, the final invention statement, and the final research performance progress report, the RPPR. All of this documentation will be sent to you in an email when the time comes and reminders through ERA Commons. This will be submitted by the signing official and will need to be submitted within 120 days of the award end. Once again, 
those details are typically provided within the notice of award, and that information, you know, should be reviewed upon the initial uh, receipt of this notice of award. Um, in addition, there's going to be this, the special terms and conditions. So if there are any restrictions um, or, or any additional funding requirements, reporting requirements, this will be outlined in the special terms and conditions. As you can see in our example, this is going to indicate the subawardee and, and their um, requirements on this award as well. Moving on to NSF. NSF is, is varies from NIH in some regards. Um, some of the specific agency requirements are going to be the initial um, email of the award. NSF does not have a just-in-time process like NIH. Typically, the notice of award for a phase one will be received and outlined. You will just need to ensure that you follow up on any sort of specific questions that are outlined in that. Actually, I'll default to you on that. Is that fine? Okay. Um, the, the notice of award will be sent via email approximately two weeks prior to the start date. For a phase one, all but $25,000 of the award will be available to the company upon receipt of that notice of award. The final $25,000 will be available upon submission and approval of the final project report. The important thing to note here is that the company is responsible for handling the final $25,000 until they have the approved report, which will be after the award has closed out. Um, some advice here would be just going by vendor, um, vendor terms and conditions and ensuring that you can kind of lay out your funding responsibilities and payment options accordingly so that the company can handle that you know period of time without the funding. Um, for phase two, funding is typically incrementally provided and that will be outlined in the notice of award. You will receive a certain percentage up front um, and then additional funding as reports are submitted and approved. The communication between the program officer and the, the company is very important. The NI, NSF typically likes to be involved in more greater detail than I would say other agencies. The, the, any changes to the budget or to the scope of the project um, in excess of about 5%, let's say, funding-wise, will need to be communicated to the program officer. Um, this, this typically is a, a fairly amicable relationship, and so having these conversations is not necessarily a big deal. But just please note that they want to be kept aware of any changes, issues, um, and, and other funding concerns as the award continues on. Part of the NSF award process requires all of the awardees to attend a initial workshop. During this workshop, a lot of information regarding the federal regulations, compliance, the financial standings, as well as the opportunity to meet with your program officer in person occurs during this, this event. Um, a lot of information comes your way and it is very valuable. Um, so take advantage of all of the opportunities that present themselves during that process. The DOD award process varies typically by agency. Um, when you're looking at whether it's part of the Air Force or the Navy, it will, it will have slightly different nuances. The program officer typically will send an email to, to let you know if you are under consideration for an award. The negotiation process will have a lot of paperwork and will align with the the uniform guidance and the typical grant regulations apl applicable to an SBIR STTR award. The, it's important, similar to NSF, to maintain close communication with your program officer um, as relationships are a very big part of the, the DOD award process. We have seen that 
a lot of times the the continuation of their success, a company's success with the DOD is based on their relationship and success with their previous phases. Um, similar to NIH, the payment will be based on a cost reimbursement. So you, you will receive funding for cost incurred. Other agencies award processes. There are other agencies, other awards, um, and once again, they, they vary slightly. Um, most of these agencies will require the following items. A justification of the indirect rate, so whether or not you are applying with a, you know, the 40% typical for an NIH or the 50% salaries and wages for an NSF, you will need to provide additional justification. Uh, the justification will include the support of your accounting um, and a breakout of those types of general and administrative and overhead costs that would build up an indirect rate. This is similar for fee. Um, fee, you will need to provide justification for how the intent of that funding is to be spent. A lot of times for fee in these early SBR, STTR awardees, the expenses for patent support and legal fees and licenses is a, a cost that can, can help justify a, a fee rate. Um, most of the companies that we've seen or worked with are not typically requesting pure profit. There is a an intent to use that funding to continue to support the activities and grow the R&D um, and help it progress further along. Um, when it comes to materials and supplies and or equipment, if approved on your proposal, you will need to provide support documentation. Typically, this is for items over $1,000. You'll need to provide a quote documenting, you know, how many, how much, when, where, and, and basically just to ensure that the, the number is a justified number. Um, when the award is received, and if that number varies, then adjustments can be made at that time. But we typically need a quote to support the initial request. Um, proof of physical location is going to be a lease agreement. There are um, times where we find clients anticipate having a lease or a space rented if at time of award. Um, when that happens and when you are going through the initial proposal process to get to the award, when that award comes more in sight, we need to ensure that we have set up um, a place of business to support the funding that we've requested um, within the initial proposal. The other things to note is that the principal investigator will need to ensure that they are 51% employed by the company throughout the period of performance. That does not mean that they have to be working directly on the grant effort. It just means their overall effort has to be 51%. Um, this is documented through a timesheet and will be part of a, an audit review. The IACUC approval for animal work and the IRB approval for the human subjects work we touched briefly upon for NIH and the just-in-time phase depending on if these are applicable parts of your proposal and your study, we will need to address similar inter-institutional agreements and assurances with the other agencies. So once the award is received, we've gone through the initial phase of checking the boxes and proving to the government that the company is well-established to maintain the funding moving forward, we really need to ensure that everything that we've agreed to in the initial process, we are, that we have support and documentation to outline those controls at time of audit. The post-award requirements are going to, at a high level will be written policies and procedures, project cost accounting system, and an adequate, adequate timekeeping system. We really want to establish these items in phase one so that we are ready for the additional funding from a phase two or additional phase one awards. Um, this will have a bigger role depending on the agency and their review prior to each phase. And we'll go into more detail 
in just a minute. So when it comes to the written policies and procedures, we really want to ensure that we're outlining the internal controls of the organization and demonstrating to the government that there are federal processes, uh, processes in place to support the federal regulations. We will typically start with the classification of personnel. So we identify the roles and responsibilities of the management team. This will flow throughout the rest of the PMPs to ensure that there's consistency throughout. As you can see from the list, we're going to look at asset management, a billing system, cost tracking and allowability, delegation of authority, invention disclosure if related, if needed, purchasing, record keeping, segregation of duties, and timekeeping. Some of the items just to note here is the, the cost tracking and allowability. And we can, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the project cost accounting system. But really the government wants to ensure that you're able to separate the direct cost related to the project separate than the indirect and unallowable costs that are accumulated for the, the general business purposes. So typically from an accounting system perspective, depending on your software, you'll set up a, a project, a profit and loss statement by job, customer, or class. This will allow you to, at any point in time, to differentiate between one award and another, as well as any general and administrative overhead cost and any unallowable or commercial activities. So we want to, at the end, during the process of the award and at the end of the award, be able to accumulate all of the expenses within the direct class related to that grant and see that it aligns with the initial proposal budget or a revised budget as things evolve during the life of the award. That is going to come into play for multiple agencies as you move forward through the, the grant process and onto additional phases. Um, the way that we want to, so we have the system set up, the accounting system to track those costs, but in addition to tracking those costs, we need to substantiate them. And what I mean by that is we need to maintain an audit trail and documentation that clearly defines what is being accounted for within those, those expense transactions. For instance, if you went out and had a, a dinner when you were attending the workshop for NSS, you would need to maintain an itemized meal receipt so that we can clearly document that the costs are within the award as a direct cost for the travel budget. However, in the event that you did have a glass of wine while you were at this dinner, we would need to separate that cost out into the unallowable category and show and demonstrate to the government that we were knowledgeable of the federal regulations and tracked those costs accordingly. So that's all part of the internal controls and establishing documentation to support those processes. For the timekeeping system, this is an area where the government does not have as much control as they would like. Um, it is hard to ensure that the level of effort being performed aligns with the proposal. In an effort to create some sort of regulation to monitor this process, the government has, coming up, has come up with a timekeeping system that requires awardees to track their effort daily by labor hour by project. So this way, there is a clear indication of the amount of time that went specifically to that project within a given day, week, month, year. Um, the part of the timekeeping system when you're tracking your time in the timesheet is going to be the proper allocation and distribution of salary. This is going to mean if a company, if an employee was making, just for round numbers, $4,000 a week and they have a 40 hour week, if 20 hours went to the grant, then $2,000 would be allocated directly to the salaries and wages as outlined in the proposal. And the remaining $2,000 would be allocated to the other project efforts, whether it was a different grant, an internal activity, a business development as part of an unallowable effort. We would want to track that funding separately within the project classes in the accounting system. So everything ties together and creates this audit trail so that the government 
has some sort of assurance that time is being adequately tracked and um, is not leading to any sort of fraudulent behavior. When it comes to the timekeeping system, once again, because it's, it's such an area of, of great concern and little oversight from the government, there are larger penalties, I would say, for, for mischarging. We cannot pay employees that have not worked on the project. We cannot ensure proper allocation of time if we don't have a timesheet. Um, and, and all of these items, as they relate to the overarching process of timesheet to salary distribution to how it's represented in your accounting system, will be reviewed and tracked by an auditor. Um, there are different types of audits depending on the agencies. At a very high level, the government requires a company to receive an audit once they have received $750,000 of federal, once they have expended $750,000 of federal funding within a year. That responsibility falls on the individual company to go out and get a private firm to audit their financials, and that report needs to be submitted to the federal government within nine months of the end of their um, fiscal year. So typically we see calendar year aligned with the fiscal year, but it can vary from company to company. So these post-award management aspects become very important, especially as a company continues its success through the, the federal funding arena. Questions? Is there a question on the Q&A? Okay. Um, yeah, we do have the one question. question. I have. Uh, okay. Can you guys see that? It's for the uh, sake of the 750,000 threshold. Do you add DOD awards to DOE awards for expenditures? Okay, so for clarification on the audit threshold, this will be for cost reversible contracts. If you're, it will include all federal awards, so if you do have DOD or DOE that are cost reimbursable, they will be included in that threshold. The reason I, I say what I'm saying is that if a, there are DOD awards that are fixed price, and because they're fixed price, they are not included in that, that overarching 750000 It's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so continuing on, we're going to look at the reporting requirements, and we'll look at you know these as they relate specifically to NIH, NSF, and other agencies. So the NIH reporting requirements. I know I mentioned earlier the payment management system. So the payment management system is going to be where you get your funding. This will be where we're going to calculate the amount of direct funding incurred during a period. Um, uh, from our company perspective, we like to do this on a, a month-end basis, and we'll calculate the indirect and fee associated to the direct funding incurred. Now, that will be the amount that we request from the payment management system for reimbursement. Within the payment management system, we are required to do quarterly financial reports. These are referred to as FFR, the Federal Financial Reports. They are they're due quarterly you know, April 1st and uh, July, October, and then January the previous of the next year. And this will allow you to true up the draws and, and demonstrate to the government the, the cash needed versus the cash on hand. Outside of the payment management system, there are other reporting requirements that are, are needed. Um, on an annual basis, you'll have the annual research misconduct report. You will receive an email early in the year from Robin Parker. Um, she will indicate that you need to either create a, a policy around research misconduct, um, and if the company has been in business with grants, you will need to report any research misconduct that may have occurred the previous year. Um, the final closeout will happen in ERA Commons, as previously mentioned. We want to review our notice of award to detail what those requirements are and the time frame in which we need to submit them. Typically, it's 120 days after the period of performance end. It will be within ERA Commons, and the three main, um, three main reports are going to be 
final SSR, the final invention statement, and the final RPPR. The research performance progress report is going to be the one item that is more technical than the others. This will be the document in which we um, identify the accomplishments and goals of the of the grant, and you know what were the final outcomes and potential commercial opportunities moving forward. So that's NIH. For NSF, there the, you will receive your funding through the awards cash management system. Um, as once again previously mentioned, for phase one, you can receive all but 25,000 up front, and for phase two, it will be incrementally funded. So as you submit reports for your phase two, you'll need to check back into the system to see if the funding has become available. Um, once again, as previously indicated, the program officers are going to be highly involved in the budget. So any changes, um, we always recommend anything more than 5% that you have that communication. Um, it typically is just an email back and forth. Um, if there are a lot of rebudgets to personnel and materials and stuff, we, there is a, a form that will be filled out to identify the changes and, and clearly state the impact on the grant. Um, and that will, once again, be approved by the program officer. The final closeout report will be important, um, as that is for your phase one and for the phase two be the, the, the final report required to receive the, the outstanding funding. Um, so I would recommend having that report kind of prepared to some extent to the best that we can um, in advance of the official period performance end date so that we can kind of tie it out, have the loose ends by the period of performance end date and submit that to the program officer as soon as possible. If you have completed your phase one and have submitted a phase two for NSF, um, in the event that the phase two is promising and that the is, is most likely going to be funded, the NSF will issue a cap review. Basically, this is a NSF audit. It will include an initial evaluation of the company's financial viability. So we'll want to ensure that the you know the ratios, the financial ratios of assets versus liabilities is favorable and that the company is in a position to receive additional funding that is not relying specifically on the NSF funding to continue their success. And so it's important in that at that phase to understand that your balance sheet and your income statement and all your financials have been tied out so that we can really show the government that the company is ready to receive that additional funding. The once that financial viability ratio is approved, they'll come back and ask for additional um, documentation to to review the company's internal controls and accounting system. This will include additional financial report, tax returns. They'll look into the timekeeping policies as well as ensuring that the phase two budget aligns with the overarching goals of the proposal and the phase one. Um, included in this too will be a project cost ledger specifically for your phase one period of performance to demonstrate to the government that there were proper accounting controls set up and that the grant was expended as indicated. So if you expended all of your funding, we'll demonstrate that. If there was any remaining funding that we had to return, um, it would also show that as well. The DOD reporting requirements, once again, will vary. However, typically, you will receive your funding from the wide area workflow. Um, the name has changed a couple times. I think it's referred to as IRAPT as well. The, um, the, the requirements for how to receive your funding will be detailed in your DOSP award. So the wild, wide area workflow, in my opinion, is a little bit more cumbersome than other um, invoicing processes from other agencies. But once you get into a rhythm, it becomes a little bit more intuitive. Um, the DOD reporting requirements will be specific to the agency and to that specific award. And all of that will be outlined in the notice of award. So depending on how often they want to receive financial reports or technical reports, final closeouts, 
um, that will all be outlined in that initial um, notice of award and, and should be looked at in great detail during that initial review of the contract. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Eva so that she can go into further detail about what we do from a, you know, moving forward phase two and continuing our success with the, the federal funding. Okay, thank you, Tara. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, uh, t type them in, but I'll move on to uh, assuming that you've uh, completed your phase one, you've finished the final reporting requirements, and now you're ready to move on to the next step. And the obvious next step, of course, is applying for your phase two. Um, the keys for applying to phase two, number one, in order to get phase two, you do have to complete all of your phase one milestones. So make sure you go back over that phase one proposal, reread what you put in your research plan, and make sure that you have accomplished those milestones. Now, if you haven't accomplished those milestones, make sure that you reach out early to your program officer to discuss any impact that might make um, in terms of uh, your eligibility to even apply for a phase two, because in some cases, if you don't complete the technical milestones in phase one, it actually might make sense to go back and, and reapply for a new phase one on that project. Um, the second key tip for phase two success is to make sure that you have demonstrated some commercial advancement of your technology. So even though your phase one proposal was all about the R&D that you were going to accomplish, you've got to have underlying BD uh, um, advancement during that phase one, you've got to show that you've taken your um, technology and that you've made some strides in the direction of commercialization. What that means is that you should be talking to potential customers, potential follow-on investors, uh, starting to draft a more comprehensive and complete business plan, looking at marketing reports, and really thinking uh, in more detail than you did during your phase one project of what that commercial product, what is the, the product profile going to look like, who are going to be the customers, and how are you ultimately going to achieve the commercial success that's required for the SBR STTR program. As your a third tip, as you're developing your phase two application, um, it's very different in terms of how it should read from your phase one. Your phase one can include high risk research. So I call that the R because research is an investigating, uh, you're looking to test a hypothesis, uh, and it may or may not go as planned. When you get to phase two, you really should have substantially de-risked the technological aspects of your uh, product. And so at that point, your research plan for phase two really shouldn't read like a research plan per se, and that you're not necessarily testing, uh, you know, basic hypotheses, but instead should be more of a development plan. And that's, that's a key area where we see a lot of errors, especially projects that may be coming out of universities, and you're really used to writing uh, proposals like R01s, um, our broad agency announcement responses to the DOD uh, that are more research driven, well, these should really be more development driven as you get to your phase two. So how are you going to take that product and get it through the regulatory pathways, um, scale it up? Those types of questions should be um, in your phase two application. Uh, the fourth point is to have a strong commercialization plan. In many agencies, the commercialization plan is equal in length to the um, uh, research plan for your phase two. Many agencies such as the NSF will actually have a separate review panel for your commercialization plan consisting of investors, uh, venture capitalists, and individuals who are going to be able to look um, at your commercial story and be able to evaluate that um, on an equal basis to the, the scientific aspects of your proposal. Um, and one thing that I'll mention is that we already had an entire webinar, um, and that was webinar number four that an excuse me, Angie Pollard provided um, on preparing strong commercialization plans. So as you get to the point where you're preparing your phase two, recommend that you go back and review webinar four in the series. Um, and also we have a book available um, uh, specifically on preparing an NIH phase two application that's also applicable for many of the other agencies as well, particularly uh, the commercialization plan. <clears throat> so as we look at funding opportunities beyond phase two, so uh, you've gotten your phase two proposal in, now you've gotten your phase two grant, and now all of a sudden the SBR, SDTR program stops. You know, it stops providing money, but there is something called a phase three in the SBR, SDTR program. And the phase three is you going out on your own and finding um, additional sources for capital. 
Um, and traditionally, remember the SBR program has been around since 1982, traditionally this might be the sort of uh, pathway that you could take um, outside of the SBR SDTR program to obtain that follow-on capital, starting with, uh, you know, friends and family funding, angel funding, and now that you're in phase two, you know, moving into venture capital. What we've seen happen, though, quite a bit that has really been challenging for phase two awardees is that they get their phase two, and they're finding that venture, they're still too early for venture capital. Um, and, and this has really been a, a big conundrum over the last seven or eight years, and different agencies have responded to it differently. Um, but essentially, what we're seeing is that this gap between your early stage investment and your venture capital later stage investment, IPOs even, has really grown. And this, you know, it's called the Valley of Death. It has other uh, terms as well. But the time and development that's going to require non dilutive grant funding has really expanded. And um, so once you have your phase two and, you know, you're going out, you're reaching out to venture capitalists, hopefully you're getting traction. But if you're not getting traction or not getting the traction that you want, um, one really good opportunity to continue to consider is what other follow-on non-dilutive funding can I have to continue to leverage as I am working to make traction in the dilutive funding space. So keep in mind, uh, you know, during your, your first phase two award, of course, you know, be, you should be pursuing additional SBR or STTRs. Um, you can, you know, start looking at different applications for your technology, go back get some more phase ones. Um, also keep in mind that some of the agencies, NIH in particular, have what's called Phase 2B awards, um, NSF as well, uh, that help to give you that additional funding you might, might need to bridge that gap after your Phase 2. Um, but also something that um, sometimes gets overlooked is that even though the SBR SGTR program is huge, $3 billion a year, there's a lot more other money available um, in the non-dilutive phase Space from all of the federal agencies, SBR STTR is only 3% of their overall extramural research budget, as well as from private foundations. And yes, a lot of this money will be directed to academic researchers, but a lot of it does go to um, companies as well. So in, in terms of what's available for me outside of SBIR or STTR um, to help, again, uh, leverage and, and further uh, extend the R&D that you need to do um, when you're in that phase two period. Um, some examples, NIH, um, RO1s, UO1s, have they have clinical trial specific grants um, and other mechanisms that are available to small businesses. The advantage of these is that many of them um, have quite large budgets and so we've seen up to five to ten million dollars uh, in, you know, companies who maybe need a clinical trial um, to, uh, and, and they can't get that through the SBR program because of the budget limits, uh, to be able to take that next step in development. So, so, so take a look at those. Um, there's also, um, NIH has recently introduced some academic industry collaborative grants, and so those are, um, you know, very nice as well, um, and, and often come with, you know, five million plus dollar budgets. The Department of Defense, outside of the SBR STTR program, um, broad agency announcements are the mechanism where most of the funding is dispersed. Uh, as the name suggests, they are very broad in scope. And so, as you see, um, for a specific uh, agency within the DOD, a broad agency announcement that, that may apply to your technology, it's very important to discuss your technology with the program officer at DOD. They're looking for certain solutions to very specific problems. And if your technology happens to address that, um, then the, the program officer will be very interested and will help to guide you in terms of what's the best uh, mechanism to apply for. Um, other agencies with, with large budgets outside of SBR, STTR, BARDA, DARPA, Department of Energy are known to provide over $5 million grants outside um, of the SBR, STTR program. With BARDA, um, there's a couple of uh, mechanisms to be able to, to start talking to the program officers there, um, and they're really looking for um, technologies that can so solve threats in, in biodefense, and um, so they're very interested in what's called a tech watch where you can apply on the website and go to DC and present your technology and help to understand where your technology might align with the current areas of interest. And those change constantly, so getting that real-time feedback in a tech watch is very valuable. 
BARDA has also recently introduced a program called BARDA Drive, um, where the application process is expedited for certain um, technological areas of high interest and for grants of $750,000 or less. And these are just a few examples. There's many others out there. So it's really worth understanding the broader non-dilutive funding landscape. For um, private foundations, um, there's a, you know, a number of foundations, many of them are, are very, very focused on their interest and their mission. And so if you are outside of that focus, that very specific focus area, it, it may be hard to get funding. But if you do happen to meet their mission and their objectives as an agency, um, you know, they, they can be a really good source of, of um, specific, very kind of targeted funding, and they can often turn around the funding very quickly. Um, so the way to know whether or not you might be a good fit is really to get to know the foundation. I generally don't um, suggest applying blindly to foundation solicitations. I really suggest getting on the phone, talk to their chief scientific officer, um, and, and better understand what is the mission of the agency. Who are the people um, who, who are at the agency, who are the decision makers, and who are the individuals who the, the agency or the foundation is looking to, to serve? What's the culture of the foundation? Is it a foundation that you know has a lot of fundraisers, and it makes sense for you to start participating in those fundraisers, you know, runs or um, banquets, and, and, and get to know um, individuals at the foundation? Um, is it a foundation that has a lot of kind of service-oriented um, events? So get to know that, and you know, make sure they're going to the foundations are going to want. Um, you know, any entities that they fund really need to fit in with that culture of the foundation. And so if you've got a company um, and the culture of foundation is service, it, it, you know, might, the foundation is going to look to see that your company does have also a, a culture of service there. Um, and also take a look at the foundation's prior history of funding. Uh, many foundations uh, may only give to academics. Many, um, you know, may have more grants directed at companies. Some are more interested in funding R&D. Some are more interested in funding patient support. So get a sense of, of the prior hunting, funding history of the foundation as well. One thing to keep in mind with foundations is that the resources are much more than just financial. Foundations are really about the mission. And so because of this, they can provide you with access to key opinion leaders who may really be critical um, in uh, adoption of your technology, um, as well as access, access to uh, patient populations that is valuable for, for clinical trials and to obtain uh, the patient perspective and feedback. Okay. So we'll finish up with some, some final tips um, based on some of the takeaways that, that we've talked about today. First off, when you get that phase one, it's a really exciting time. You just want to get going. You want to hit the ground running. You want to do your science. But it is so important right when you get that phase one to properly set up your accounting and internal infrastructure. Um, if you wait, for, for every day you wait, it's, it's a day you're going to have to backtrack and, and redo your accounting system and, and redo, um, you know, retroactively try to write policies and procedures, and it really um, is going to negatively impact the audit um, that, that you will have. Um, so from day one, um, you know, make sure that you, um, uh, you are totally cleaned up and in compliance uh, with both the uh, internal policies and com um, accounting system required for, for the uh, grant awards. Number two, um, start working on your phase two early. As soon as you get that phase one, you might want to start thinking about, okay, what ideally, if phase one goes perfectly, what am I going to want to, um, you know, uh, put into my phase two application so that you can start uh, thinking about uh, what's going to be required to get you there. So not only completing your phase one studies, but you may need to start talking to some potential uh, academic partners, maybe some contract research organizations, manufacturers, um, and especially the commercial aspects of your phase two. So make sure that you don't forget to continue doing business development while you're working on your phase one research. Um, these business relationships are going to be important for your commercialization plan. When you write your commercialization plan, you're definitely going to want to include letters of support, and by having strong relationships, those letters are going to um, really come, come across as more genuine. Finally, I also, if you have a change in your scope of work um, in your phase one, make sure that you discuss that right away with your program officer um, as early on as possible, um, and so that you can, uh, you know, take proper steps to ensure as much as possible that you would still be eligible for your phase two. 
And uh, another tip is explore all the options for follow-on funding as I've gone through um, both investor funding as well as additional grant resources. Um, it's uh, never a bad thing to have too much funding. I think some companies, you know, you can get a little bit narrow and say, oh, I got my million phase two, that's going to be enough to get me to commercialization. Well, unfortunately, things don't always go in plan as planned. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the process is, is such that uh, you really should have your backup plans in place. Have funding for as many sources as you can. Understand that the process of commercialization almost always takes longer than expected. But if you are persistent and patient and if you continue to pursue all the opportunities that are available for you, all the resources um, that we've discussed over this webinar series, um, you know, we, we, you really can, um, you know, achieve that commercial success that, that, that you're aiming for. All right. Well, this concludes our webinar series. Um, we definitely wish you the best of luck on all of your grant submissions and um, most importantly on commercializing uh, your innovations and the contributions that, that those innovations will make uh, throughout society. I do want to thank uh, my colleague Kara who's uh, helped out uh, and presented all of the uh, uh, information today on what you need to be aware of as well as the entire EGC team, the Small Business Administration um, for funding and uh, especially um, the KIPP program, Kentucky Innovation, um, Christine, David, and the team for um, uh, arranging and, and uh, for facilitating this series.